And he's with us this morning from Clute, Texas, Republican presidential candidate and Texas Congressman Ron Paul. Good morning, Congressman. The question that we Good have morning. to the question that we have to ask this morning. You haven't won a state primary, also coming off of another weekend in Louisiana. You're trailing in the delegate count. Romney has 10 times the number of delegates that you do. It's obvious that you're not going to win the nomination. So when are you going to drop out? Well, so far there's not a declared winner. We have a ways to go. Yes, I am trailing, but the race isn't over. But I think the Republicans deserve at least one candidate to talk about sound money, balanced budget and the free market and the others don't talk about this I, I sincerely believe we need this I mean the best, best we can do is come up uh, the Republican leadership comes up with a budget that's going to maybe balance a budget in 30 years I mean they're not taking this problem seriously I think this, we're in a serious problem I think somebody has to speak out that we need to cut spending and balance a budget and limit the amount of spending that we're doing overseas if we don't address that see that's taboo you're not allowed to talk about any of the militarism overseas and as long as you can't even talk about it believe me the financial problems of this country is going to get a lot worse congressman Paul it would seem that you believe the longer you stay in the race uh, the more you're going to be able to shape the party plan Platform. How do you know whether you're having any success? How do you know whether it's worthwhile? Because, as you know, there are many people who are critical of the primary process thus far and say the GOP simply can't get its act together and, and unite behind a candidate who can take on President Obama. You know, you know, I don't understand that. I mean, that's what a primary is for, is to discuss the issues. I think the discussion should continue. Uh, since nobody is really discussing the alternative to our foreign policy or our monetary policy or our financial crisis and spending, why should we quit and say, oh, okay, you know, it's getting late. We all have to get together. We have to quit debating the issues. So, no, I think, I think the debate should go on. That's what primaries are for. And it's not like this is the first time they didn't have a candidate by this time in the cycle I mean the Democrats didn't have one by this time last go around it didn't happen till June so uh, I think that's just a lot of a lot more talk than and then reality I don't think it hurts to debate the issues and that's what I want to do congressman you haven't been attacking the front runner Mitt Romney too much would you be interested in a role in the Romney administration as the leader of the libertarian movement <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad you say too much because it is true that I have had ads on against Governor Romney. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's likely to happen. I, I doubt very much if uh, he would consider it. Uh, I, we have cordial relations, you know, we talk to each other, and I think he's the kind of person that at least listens when I say something. We just have disagreements, you know, on, on the spending and the policies. I believe in a lot less government than he does, and the, our foreign policy and monetary policy is completely different. So I don't think that's likely to happen, so, but we have to wait and see what comes out of this election. Uh, Congressman, look, let's, let's make the assumption that Either Mitt Romney or Rick Santorum is going to win the Republican nomination. Between the two, who's making the most sense on foreign policy and economic policy? I, I don't see a whole lot of difference. I, I see a big difference in tone, uh, but I don't see any difference in policy. Uh, they both are very, very anxious to keep uh, the military very active and, and you know, use troops in Syria and, and plan on, uh, you know, being very aggressive against Iran. I, I, don't, I don't think that's necessary. I think that's causing more problems and, and leads more to war rather than peace and prosperity. And I don't think it's, it's necessary to do that. So I don't see the policies. And even Newt has a policy that's very much the same. But tone, there definitely is a different tone. I, I think uh, uh, Governor Romney is more likely to be uh, more willing to listen to his advisors. If he decides he wants to go and bomb Iran, maybe he might listen to somebody else. I'm afraid the other ones would just go do it anyway. I, I want to ask you, Congressman, uh, about the historic debate at the Supreme Court this week on Obamacare. What are you expecting there? You know, I guess that's up, up for up for grabs. I suspect they're going to rule it constitutional, but that's as I mean, that's a pure guess out of the thin air. You know, the whole reason we had this interstate commerce clause was not to regulate the economy; it was to deregulate it. They wanted free trade zones. They wanted to get rid of tariffs in between the states, and they want a unified currency. So, what they need to be talking about is deregulate insurance, so we can sell insurance across state lines. That would be a proper role. But to use the interstate commerce clause 
is to monopolize and institutionalize national health care. That is a disaster. But I'm afraid the sentiment, although this, this Supreme Court is slightly better than in the past, they haven't done a real good job in defending the free market and the original intent of the Interstate Commerce Clause, which was to deregulate, not use it as an excuse to do anything or force you to buy something. This would be a real tragedy if they uh, rule and, and uh, support this law. Congressman, the debate now in the markets, QE3. Charles Plosser of the Philadelphia Fed said right here on Inside Track just an hour ago, not at the moment, but he's still open to considering it. So for you, the question is, what would QE3, more monetary stimulus, mean? Well, it just would erode the value of the dollar, and the people would suffer that much more. The middle class suffers. When you inflate a currency and destroy its value, the wealth is transferred from the middle class and the poor to the wealthy. So you, you just continue that process. That's already, you know, what our problem is. But, you know, they talk about QE1 and 2 and whether there's going to be 3, but actually the first QE was uh, under Greenspan when he, everybody recognized, well, one of the big problems we had was that he kept interest rates too low too long. So it's, it's constant. It's the whole process that, that wealth is supposed to come out of the creation of uh, monetary units out of a computer. That's a fallacy, and it, it has failed in the past, and you can't solve the problem that it created by creating even more money. So, uh, yes, they're going to hang it out there, and the markets will like it. Oh, if they announce today, there's gonna, yeah, they're going to have more quantitative easing. They'll say, oh, this is, this is wonderful. But down the road, it's a disaster. Well, well, Congressman Paul, it's not just the markets that might like it. Let's look at some of the economic indicators. You know, the economy is expected to grow in excess of 2% this year, better in 2013, close to 3% in 2014. Core inflation, what most people look at, moderate, under 2%, unemployment declining. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Well, well, not too much, but it's pretty darn expensive to create trillions of dollars and get that meager growth. But, but the whole thing is, is those numbers aren't exactly accurate. If you talk about inflation, the real inflation rate uh, is closer to 9% if you use the old CPI and you talk to the average person or the person receiving Social Security. But even Bernanke, uh, you know, assumes, well, we can destroy the value of the currency uh, at 2%. What right does somebody have to take your money and give you $98 back again? But that's possible. Policy. And 2% can be 4 or 8 or 10% and they can't control it. They have no way they can control prices other than wage and price controls. But, and that is always a disaster. But Congressman, but Paul, idea... there's, Congressman Paul, there is no evidence of an inflation problem right now as a result of all of this policy. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, if, it depends on how you define inflation. Inflation is increases the supply of money and credit, and sometimes it raises prices. And sometimes it might raise prices in one area and not others. So oil prices are going up. Medical care costs are going up. Education costs are going up. Uh, and, and food prices in many areas are going up. So to say that we don't have an inflation problem, but the inflation, the distortion of the interest rates, the manipulation of the business cycle is the real problem. It's the price fixing and the malinvestment and the increase in the debt and the problems we've had, the severe crisis that we had in, uh, in 08 and 09. This came from inflation. And right now, they're inflating like crazy. Crazy. They're keeping interest rates at 1% or less. That's inflation, and that distorts the market. So you don't even know what the price of money should be. So you don't have savings. They don't, that doesn't determine interest rates. The Fed determines. So you have the consequence of inflation, which is very, very severe. And this is why we're not really getting out of this recession. All so right. if you look at a couple of those statistics, that sounds good. But that, that's far from a real recovery. All right. I just want to ask you about gold here, because you've brought the gold standard back into the conversation in the debate last week. In fact, Ben Bernanke talked about it in his lesson, four slides on it. He says the gold standard doesn't work if you look at history. I want to give you a chance to respond very quickly in 20 seconds. Okay, um, he, he said it didn't work, and it, it, was, it was flawed because they didn't always follow it, but they always had fraction reserve banking, and it caused uh, booms and busts. Uh, but the gold standard always brought them back down. I mean, just think of uh, we were still on a pretty good gold standard in 1921, 22, 2021, and that way recovery occurred in one year. But the distortion was not because of the gold standard. It was because they didn't follow the gold All standard. Right. So gold, gold restrains the government, and they, it, you don't have debt in deficits like we have today if you had a okay, gold standard. Okay, Ron Paul, we have to leave it there. Thanks very much.